Hello, my friends. Welcome to this final edition of Lunch with Friends and Strangers brought to you by Carolina Public Humanities. My name is Max Orr. I'm the Executive Director for Carolina Public Humanities. Um, I want to thank a few of our sponsors. We have our want to thank uh, Cotton Merkin Group at Morgan Stanley and Carolina Meadows for their wonderful support of all of our programs. And of course, our partners, the North Carolina Yana Society and the General Alumni Association for uh, their wonderful support of our programs, including our uh, K-12 teacher workshops and community college outreach. So thank you to all of our partners. Thank you for joining us. We have a very intimate crowd here today. Crowd might be a... a, a not necessarily the right word for what we have, but we're very happy to welcome you. And we certainly wanna remind you folks that you can catch all of Lunch with Friends and Strangers on our YouTube channel. We know we had about uh, more than the folks that have arrived here today have signed up for it. So hopefully they'll get a chance to watch this. Everyone should go to our YouTube channel, Carolina Public Humanities and subscribe to it. We have uh, hundreds of hours of content that we've been adding and certainly more will come. Um, you can see over, uh, I don't know if it's to your left, but on the screen, it's to my left. Uh, we have first want to welcome our friend, uh, Daniel Cobb, Professor of American Studies, a fantastic scholar, um, an absolute uh, and a good friend as well, who a uh, talented musician as well. Welcome, uh, Dan. How are you? I'm doing great. It's wonderful to be here. And uh, how has your summer been so far? And you uh, and are you reopening, as they say? Uh, it's been busy. I, I'm actually teaching two classes simultaneously. I'm just wrapping them up. So summer one online and then a, a course with um, Warren Correctional Facility. And um, so those are wrapping up now. And no, I'm not opening up. I, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that things are better, but I'm not about to go rushing back yeah. into the world as it were. So <laughs> we're, we're not in the real world at all. Well, um, but let's get to uh, let's get to the point and uh, uh, why we're here today. What we do with Lunch with Friends and Strangers, of course, we talk with uh, friends, faculty members at the uh, UNC Chapel Hill, and they bring someone of interest, um, sometimes famous, sometimes more obscure, but always interesting. Um, we like we don't like to call them strangers because we want them to be friends by the end of this uh, by the end of this event. So let's quickly get right to it and talk about who it is we are going to be learning about today. Darcy McNichol. Uh, Dan, what can you tell me, uh, just in general, if, could you sort of give me the big, broad idea of Darcy McNichol and why it is we should know about Darcy McNichol and where uh, Professor McNichol fits in the broader scheme of American and First Nations history? You bet. Well, I mean, the short of it is that Darcy McNichol is one of the most important American Indian writers, intellectuals, and I would say activist, but we can talk about the way that we think about what activism is and what forms it takes. But um, political reformer slash activist of the of the 20th century. And so he's important because of what he has produced as a writer, as a thinker, as a doer in mm -hmm. Native America, transformative in a number of different ways. But he's also important because of the way he is known and not known. And my scholarship, as well, we can talk about, is really an attempt to remake or recover a sense of him, his self, that I think, to the extent that we have come to know him, uh, is flawed and limited. And this is kind of what brings us to the question of biography and how we conceive of personhood and, and self and yeah. Uh, what it means to, uh, in the words of James Clifford, as as people who are exploring the lives of others, what does it mean to deliver a self? Yeah. And uh, so my work is a meditation on that, and Darcy's life as a window into that problem is yet another layer of what makes him just a really important figure, um, who, in the process of asking this question, causes us to think completely differently about what it means to be Indigenous what indigenous worlds look like, what mm -hmm. settler colonialism has done and not done to Native America and Native personhood. So yeah, it operates on a number of levels, his life does, and it's significant. Well, I, you know, I can, as a, you know, being the host of this program in which we've done dozens of these iterations, I can really appreciate your commentary about biography and what biography means. And, and, and it's, you know, it's always, there's something we are recreating people uh, by looking at context and looking at their actions, but we it's hard to get a sense of a person entirely, isn't it? And um, and we read them in different ways. How do you, when you approach 
you, I know, and I'm just going to quickly pull this up because I do, I want to make people aware of the type of work that you've done. Um, so I pull this up, you know, we, we, we see who you are. You've been uh, working on native activism, native activism, uh, looking at, um, certainly I know your work on, on Clyde Warrior uh, is very, you know, issue about, um, that's another biographical piece here. So how is it that, that your work is intersecting with pulling, uh, understanding these people as people themselves, but also within the context of the actions that they're doing and, and what it means for, in particular, your scholarly interests? Well, what you're seeing actually in that slide is sort of the uh, condensed narrative of my intellectual journey. You know, yeah. I, I started off being interested in sort of American Indian policy. And the deeper I got, the more I realized that the story that I wanted to tell was about politics. And that in turn has caused me to think the more, especially I, well, I'll talk about this with McNichol, the more I interviewed people who made the history that I was writing about, um, the more it caused me to really think anew about what it means to engage in politics, what it means to be an activist and to take purposeful action. And so each of these works that you're seeing here are different ways in which I've been pursuing these questions. Mm -hmm. And the work on Darcy McNichol is the next step, you know, yeah. from going from this macro level to this micro personal level of intellectual history. And what we find out, I think, about Darcy McNichol, it's this shared and distinctive trajectories of history. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, among the questions that I ask, and I think is really important for anybody dealing with biography, is to ask, you know, what it is that's distinctively about that person, what's really unique about that person and their experience. But what are the contexts in which these people live their lives and to what extent do they help us to understand things well beyond their mm -hmm. self and their personal experience and vice versa? And so, you know, I think Darcy McNichol's life is this lens into what it means to be a person of, of Métis descent, mm -hmm. um, living in a community that he doesn't belong to it, mm -hmm. genealogically okay yeah. um he is let's, a ref get, let's his, get into yeah. his origins when you when was he born his parents um and you mentioned the metis descent it's for those that aren't familiar with uh indigenous studies do you explain what the metis and the connection to america and canada and how all of that works yeah so so metis people are essentially a product of what we call ethnogenesis and mm -hmm. The Métis people are a people and recognized as, as, as a nation. Mm -hmm. um, but that is literally a product of settler colonialism in the sense that Métis people are descended primarily from um, relationships between particularly Cree people and, mm -hmm. and, and the French. And over time, a unique, distinctive community unto itself developed called Métis. Um, and what happened in the United States is that basically Métis refugees of war in the late 19th century, um, in the wake of the Riel Rebellion, basically wound up living inside different reservation communities, especially through the kind of the border region there. Mm -hmm. And that is how Darcy McNichol came to be in the Flathead Reservation. So his family were among these refugees of war mm -hmm. in the late 19th century. He was born on the Flathead Reservation in 1904. And the Flathead, just to, to clarify, the Flathead Reservation was created to, for which peoples? So the, that's, a, that's a great question because we, this is ethnogenesis on a yeah. whole other level. Um, the, the reservation is actually called... Um, but the Flathead Reservation of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Peoples. So, okay. you know, Flathead is not a yeah. singular tribal designation. Yeah. Uh, the Flathead is a reservation that consists of people who, because of their interactions with the United States federal government, came to belong to the same geographic space. Yeah. This conf so that's a confederated tribe of different peoples living in this one place. And that reservation was created in 1855. Um, wow. And then, you know, 
we talked about his world, he's born into a world that is being just totally reconstituted in the very midst of his birth. He's born the year that that reservation is allotted or essentially deconstructed by the U.S. federal government. But we can talk so about this that is later. 19, 1904 he was born. That's right. And so um, so what again was sort of situate himself in this context, uh, brothers and sisters, um, a large family, small family, what kind of um, labor opportunities were there for the parents? What, what was life like on that? And you're saying it's being pulled apart and deconstructed, so it's in transition. What does yeah. that transition mean for living daily life for him? Well, uh, I mean, it, it means that this is a really terrible, violent space uh, that we would do well not to underestimate. And, um, and yet you have to live through it. Right. Because, you know, you don't what, what choice do you have other than to, to make of it what you possibly can. And I think that that's something that I think we lose sight of uh, pretty easily as outsiders looking into the lives of other people. But so his mother is Métis. Yes. And his father was Scots Irish. Uh, and so he was someone who just kind of wound up on the Flathead Reservation, married her and uh, Philomene. And then he's born the very year that the reservation begins to get allotted. And what happens when reservations are allotted, what the federal government does is it essentially creates a role, a tribal role or a census of the population. And it's done to for the very express purpose of deconstructing this space. And there are maps that we can look at later on if you want that shows the, how the reservation is actually subdivided and allotted. And I actually locate Darcy's allotment. Yeah. But what happens is, you know, his mother is not flathead. His father is certainly not flathead. Darcy is not, you know, flathead, yeah. not Salish, not Kootenai. So, they petition to be enrolled at that time so that they can get allotments. And so uh, Darcy, I believe, has two sisters. It's not a huge family, but each of them, they petition the tribal council and they are allotted. And that is how he becomes flathead. So he wow. is a person of Métis, Scots-Irish descent, who becomes a political citizen of the Salish and Kootenai uh, peoples, the confederated tribes of the Salish and Kootenai and the Flathead Reservation. That's a really interesting dynamic between sort of a collective identity and this allotment idea reminds me of sort of the taking apart of communal land and, and sort of atomizing people. Is that what's happening? You're creating atomized folks who have their allotments of land that becomes a sort of a matter of control. Uh, so is that, is, was that one of the goals of the deconstruction is to sort of atomize these folks and put them in as individual yep. landowners so that you have uh, destroy that communal ties. Yeah, I think individuation, atomization of self and of yeah. collective identity, collective land, all of its part and parcel. You know, Patrick Wolf, um, the, the late anthropologist, is the person we really look to at, as the person who defined settler colonialism. Mm -hmm. And uh, Patrick Wolf defines settler colonialism as um, a process through which uh, colonizers seek to destroy, to replace. Mm -hmm. And that's what allotment is doing. Allotment yeah. and assimilation are, are destroying everything that is indigenous in order to replace it with an alternative means of defining oneself, one's relationship to the land, the land itself, one's polity. I mean, all of it. Um, and it's all a part of, well, um, the logic of elimination or of erasure. Yeah. So the federal government has the idea that it's setting in motion at the very moment of this person's birth, a, the complete unmaking of who he is supposed to be as a person, where yeah. he is supposed to be in a place, how he should see himself as belonging to a family, to a community, to a nation, the whole, the whole thing. Interesting. Yeah, you have this wonderful... Uh, uh, you, you write on one of your slides here, a textual cartographer who remapped indi indigenous personhood and experience with their words. So this is very much in reaction to sort of the sense of, uh, and you have this wonderful quotation from Frantz Fanon as well, in the world I am heading for, I am endlessly creating myself. 
um, that that transitive state that he's brought into where this is all being broken up forces people like Darcy McNichol when they engage in, in their education, which we'll talk about and they engage in what is gonna be their output, that that is one of the central questions that they're asking about is personhood and place within this context of indigenous life. And I guess for a lack of a better word, normative American life at this point. Yeah, you, you, had, you had asked us to think about, you know, the person that you're writing about is the X of Y, right? Yeah. And I, I really scratched my head a lot about this, but I suggest that Darcy McNichol is kind of the James Baldwin or uh -huh. Franz Fanon in some ways yeah. of Native American. I don't mean that as a direct analogy, yeah. but yeah, I think that when you look at Baldwin, for instance, he's a writer, but he's a lot more than a writer, mm -hmm. you know? Um, uh, and I think Baldwin, in terms of the way that he wrote about blackness and about masculinity, um, mm -hmm. black personhood, you know, I see him as a kind of a person who is remapping blackness, black personhood yeah. and experience with the word, words. And that's what I see Darcy McNichol doing through his literature, but even more for my, my work, it's his diary. And yeah, and then that, that's what connects to Franz Fanon, you know, he... Darcy McNichol, James Baldwin, all of these people are world makers. And, yeah. and it, in making a world on their own terms, they are refusing a world that is being foisted upon them. And that's, again, when you come back to significance, Darcy McNichol is a way through which we can understand the racialization of people, the yeah. refusal of racialization, colonialism and settler colonialism, and what it does, not just to not just to economies and land and polities, but to people mm -hmm. and how people have to navigate that reality. Well, Darcy is just as good a person to seek out answers to those questions mm -hmm. as anybody, even though he's often not seen that way. Well, we're going to get into some details, but uh, on, you know, education and output, you know, what, what, what he chose to do with his, with his uh, inquisitiveness and the output and what he chose to write about. Um, you know, just one question. Uh, it, it also seems very self-conscious, and and uh, I just you. This is a person who is Metis on one side and Scots Irish on the other. And did he? Could he have chosen to have migrated off of out of indigenous life and try to assimilate? If he had, I mean, again, obviously the way that he was raised. This is not you don't you don't repudiate your home. You don't repudiate yourself. I'm just wondering. Was that a conscious choice to sort of stay within the native world and the indigenous world? Well, see, what I think is important about Darcy McNichol is he complicates all of those questions. Yeah. Like, are those, are those, and I'm not saying they're not, but I'm just yeah. saying, are those even the right questions? I don't and, know. And, and, <laughs> I don't either. And, and I think, I think, I think that the assumption that we do know is part of the problem uh, in the past scholarship. Um, so you know, is, is Darcy McNichol navigating between two worlds or yeah. is he through his very being transcending that very binary and that dichotomy because he has to, yeah. um, you know, it's an interesting thing. I have argued in previous scholarship that I think Darcy's identity was most important only when people asked him when they made it an issue, when their own understanding of what it means to be who he is, is mm -hmm. something they needed an answer to. And it happens a lot, but, yeah. but I'm not sure that I, Darcy, especially when you look at his diary, I'm not sure that McNichol lived his life according to those terms. And I think what he was doing was carving out a space for himself, mm -hmm. remaking a sense of place, and those places are indigenous places. So, you know, the question is a profound one that you're asking. Where is the indigenous world? What is yeah. the indigenous place? What does it mean to belong? Yeah. So if he's not on the flathead, is he home? Yeah. And I would say, yeah, because he makes a sense of place. And that's why that garden's so important, by the way. Yeah, well, we'll talk about the garden. <laughs> Let's, we got, what, what happens, what always happens with lunches, friends and strangers is our, our initial conversation ends up going on because it's just so fascinating. But let's get into some brass tacks details. Education. Um, we certainly hear a lot about Indian schools uh, these days. That's Especially horrible. now. 
Yes, a horrible, horrible revelations that have come out of Canada. And of course, this is not just restricted and to here. Canada. Yeah, exactly. No. I was just about to say, not restricted to Canada at all. So um, how about education? Uh, we certainly know he writes, uh, we'll talk about his output. Where? How does that begin? What is he educated in? Um, is, it, is it extraordinary, his education, or was it typical for other peers that he might have been raised with? Uh, probably both. Um, you know, he once wrote in a letter that, Growing up on the Flathead Reservation, well, he said, he said, uh, it was a hell of a place to grow up in. That's how he put it. And when you try to think about what that actually means, you know, how do you assign meaning to words? You know, mm -hmm. what does it take to access what is actually embedded in a statement like that? Um, that that's those are really important questions, right, mm -hmm. for us to ask ourselves. So. Um, and the more you know, the better you can get at, at that kind of question. But mm -hmm. at any rate, um, he was born in 1904. Uh, the Jesuits had established a pretty long-term presence already at that point. Mm -hmm. They were invited into, to, and so what you're seeing here is that's the ancestral land of mm -hmm. the Pendere, Flathead, uh, the uh, uh, Salish and Kootenai peoples. Mm -hmm. And what you're seeing is how it gets condensed into that darker gray area, which is what becomes the Confederated Salish and Kootenai okay. tribes of the Flathead Nation. Um, and then the map on the right is showing you the allotments that were divided yeah. out and how that land ownership changed. So he uh, is born on the Flathead. He winds up going to mission schools as a young person. And then he is sent off to the Chemoa Indian um, Training School in Oregon for several years in the 1910s. Mm -hmm. He comes back home. Could, could, well, just to, could you yeah. give me some sense of what that type of school was in Oregon that he was sent away to? It was the off-reservation boarding schools that are in the news today. That's so, so this is a place where they're uh, cleaning the Indian out of folks well, killing the Indian to save the man is, is yep. the mantra that was used to describe what the curriculum was about in this larger project, what it was about. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, he was, I guess, the, you know, the news today, um, these past couple of weeks, just for me, it, it's, it's, it adds even more gravity to what his experience must have been like, you know, because you have children you know, disease um, and different flus uh, and illnesses breaking out um, there. But I mean, children are dying of, of you know, abuse, <laughs> abuse, but also homesickness, you know, and depression. I mean, they're all all of these things going on there. And, you know, he just doesn't write directly about it. So you have to just sort of speculate about it, what it means. But the news that we're getting now about, you know, these mass unmarked graves, you know, there's there's no way that that wasn't a part of his experience. And so on the other hand, you know, he also fell in love with music there. He learned to play the fiddle at the boarding school. Um, he, you know, I don't know at what point he decided he wanted to be a writer and what at what point he wanted to to go on to become an intellectual basically. Yeah. But at some point he set himself to that task. Um, there's, it's a long and interesting road. I mean, you know, his family relocates to Washington for a time during World War I, then they come back to the flathead. He goes uh, to, to university at, at uh, Montana. Well, you provided some great pictures here. Tell me, this is uh, from when he was younger, obviously this is sort of the 1910s and 20s. What are the what are we looking at here, and and why did you choose these as sort of uh, you call them obstacles? What are we? Looking yeah, at? you you had asked about you know what kind of obstacles they faced. Yeah. Well, he is in the middle of the complete destruction of the place that was supposed to be his home, and so you're seeing at the top left um, a land, a land rush in the midst of happening. Once the reservation is, they, they would use the term opened, yeah. you know? So what happens is the reservation would have been mapped out. The census would have been taken. Each person on that census would have been allocated a, an allotment. And then it, this is where the magic happens. You know, 
the vast majority of the land is not allotted and it gets defined as surplus land. Well, oh, that, surplus, <laughs> that <laughs> surplus land is then sold yep. to non-Indians. So, you know, well, that, Dan, I just, I, wish, the other, yeah. I just heard the other day about the difficulties in 2020 for, uh, for indigenous on the census collecting data from reservations. I just heard a, an amazing report in 2020 about the difficulties of getting good census numbers um, and right. you know because of the distrust and other reasons uh, you know I'm understandable uh, but that's just so galling to see what are the results of a census in this case the census is taken we end up with a bunch of this surplus land right so-called yeah yeah exactly. right and so, so it, well you go from 20 million acres of ancestral land okay mm -hmm. which is then reduced to what becomes the reservation, that is then allotted, and Salish uh, and Kootenai people are left with 245,000 acres 50 years later. And so the map that you're seeing in the top right here, that little mm -hmm. tiny red dot, that is Darcy McNichols' allotment. That's what's left of the world that he was born into by the time he makes a decision to sell it so that he can study at Oxford University, actually. Mm -hmm. And then the image on the bottom right there are some young young boys at the uh, Chemoa school. Yeah. And you kind of get a sense. It's like a military kind of environment. Uh, they dress in uniforms. They would have marched. They would have been forced to celebrate all the so-called American holidays, you know, yeah. all the things that make America great again, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it was all meant to rewire their heads and sense of themselves so that they would leave this these spaces that they were coming from behind this is where were these spaces ever uh you know when you have sort of um a shared sense of oppression or a shared sense of control do these spaces ever work the opposite way and get people to actually identify themselves more as part of this shared sense of oppression because they're coming from all over the place do you know what do you understand what i'm saying is that a, oh yeah yeah is this, sure. uh, does this inform darcy mcnichols sort of sense of um activism i think yes it absolutely does um just a, a last note you know I, I wanted to kind of feature each of those maps together but i couldn't figure out a way to do it very well but but what you're seeing um in these images is the map on the right there's a river valley between two uh, mountain chains. That's what essentially defines this reservation. Is that this right here, or? Where, but where? yes, yeah, more or less. But what? Okay. But what you wind up seeing is that literally, Salish and Kootenai people are pushed to the margins. They are marginalized. Non-Indians come in and basically get the best land for farming, you know, and become the majority population on the reservation by the time you get to the 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. And native people are literally pushed to the margins, which is that rocky, less fertile land. And, and that's what I was trying to show with these yeah. images. And then the question becomes, well, how do you make a living, right? Well, yeah. a lot of people can't. And so Darcy realized that, well, for him, that there was not a future for him mm -hmm. there. And so he left. But the question you asked is a really important one. And there's a really wonderful literature about, you know, how do people make the best of these situations at boarding schools? And so you don't abandon your identity, you remake it at a certain level. And so boarding schools absolutely are sites where mm -hmm. young people from all over Native America wind up forming a different kind of identity as Indian people mm -hmm. instead of as, you know, Salish or yep. Diné or you know, uh, Lakota or whatever. First Nations or thousands of right. First Nations, yeah. So there's a certain collective identity that emerges from these spaces yeah. and and real and meaningful relationships with one another and, and that develop an activism that flows from that too. So yeah, there's a lot going on there. Uh, yeah, but I, think, I tell I you what, I always, go ahead. I would just want, I think this is the, this is the map we wanted to look at where you put all of them together. You can see- yes. This, yeah, how that's absolutely remaking that world. But please go ahead. What you were going to say. Well, I was just going to say that, you know, it's really important to talk about agency, you know, yeah. learning how to play the fiddle, joining a touring band, playing on the football team, you know, all that kind of stuff is happening at boarding school. It's just meeting 
and courting, right? And finding the person you spend the rest of your life. That's all part of it. But even as we focus on agency, you can't forget about the violence that is being done in these spaces. Yeah. And, and that's what, because that's what makes that agency extraordinary. That's what makes, sure. you know, the, the persistence, the resilience is a word that yeah. we use a lot these days, all the more extraordinary. And, and that's what Darcy's experiencing here. Well, it's a, and again, you're, the, this overriding theme about how do you make the self? How do you how do you affirm the humanity of yourself? And it takes you know incredible, like you said, incredible resources uh, and an incredible context for this to happen. This remaking of the self within this sort of oppression, removal, erasure, and you're sort of forced to do this in a way, right? And I think so because that's life, right? And that, some that's, people, that's what you got dealt. So let's talk, uh, you know, we know Darcy McNichol because of his great output and his education. How does this develop um, beyond the, the school when you mentioned Oxford? So tell us about his, his academic journey. Well, what's so amazing about Darcy McNichol is he never graduates. So he, he winds up getting an honorary doctorate, actually, and he spends his, the, the last years of his life actually in the academe. Mm. But so he, you know, he, he survives the boarding school. Uh, he winds up at some pu public schools um, for high school and whatnot, bounces around from Oregon to Washington and then back to Montana again. And he goes to college and he falls in love with literature and he fully intends to become a writer. And uh, in his, I guess it was after his junior year at the University of Montana, he decides to sell his allotment Mm -hmm. And he attend, intends to go to um, Oxford to finish his degree there. And he gets there and, you know, we don't have a lot of details about it, but it, it didn't go according to plan. Yeah. He didn't like it. Um, I think that he just kind of experienced uh, some roadblocks there in terms of the credits and maybe the cost and, and other things. But he winds up kind of just spending time both in uh, – Paris and Grenoble. Mm -hmm. And then he comes home. But when he comes home, he doesn't come back. He doesn't finish his degree and he doesn't go back to Montana. He winds up in New York and city and, and in Philadelphia for a short period of time. Well, you know, and when I asked that question about this shared sense of oppression in a in a school, it, I was thinking in my mind of what happened in the 1920s in Paris when all of these colonial people came and talked to each other and said, oh boy, you know, this is you know, I'm from Senegal and you're from Vietnam, but we see, you know, a similar, you know, so was he, a, was he influenced by that in his travels at all? Did he, you're saying he was in Paris. This is the place that I know was, this was happening. Did, did he write about it in his diary at all or any sense? So the diary starts in 1930 ah, and sure. it continues into the early seventies and there are big holes even within yeah. that, but we don't have I, I don't know if he didn't keep a diary or we just, you know, he, it wasn't saved. Something yeah. happened to it. It's hard to say. It would be fascinating to know yeah, who certainly would. he actually interacted with. But, you know, what we do know or what I feel like I know is that he absolutely immersed himself in that kind of milieu. You know, mm -hmm. so when he winds up in New York, he lives in Greenwich Village. He lives on 41 Commerce Street. He goes to all the places the Bohemian writers went to. So it wouldn't surprise me if he wasn't seeking out those kinds of spaces yeah. when he was also in this Paris. Is the era of the Harlem Renaissance, right? You know, this is uh, so certainly if he's in New York and writing, he has to be aware of that literary circle that's going on. So, yeah, he's extraordinary. And he 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 is learned in a way that a lot of us just aren't anymore. But like, this is a person who was interested in everything, read everything, you know, he reads mm -hmm. in the sciences. He is a great, uh, he's very passionate about music, about classical music. Mm -hmm. He's reading history, he's reading literature. You know, he is a kind of Renaissance sort of thinker as an intellectual. And so, you know, I don't, I don't know where those boundaries for him were, yeah. Uh, but the diary is really cool because it gives you a sense, not just of like, what he did from day to day, but what he listened to, what mm -hmm. he read, the movies that he went to, the plays that he saw, all of that. 
That's yeah. so great. What a wonderful, what a wonderful resource, right? And that yep. must be so much fun to work with. So we see these titles, The Surrounded, Runner in the Sun, Wind from an Enemy Sky. Let's talk about literary output. When were these published? Were they well received? Um, and do we see a, 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 some sort of evolution in his writing through these works? Well, that's a great question. Well, gosh, that's such a complicated question. So well, let's the start with the details. Why don't we start with the details of like the sure. dates and what these what these texts are about? So he's already writing. He's writing for his college uh, paper. He's getting little pieces placed very in various journals already in the, the late twenties and early thirties. He's working actually as an editor in New York City. He winds up doing some publishing for. Um, the Federal uh, Writers Project um, during the New Deal. And then this, in the whole time he's working on The Surrounded, which is, I would consider, I think other people consider it to be his master work. I mm -hmm. have different takes on this. That's 1936. Runner in the Sun is published in 1954. His life takes a very dramatic turn during the Depression. He kind of is not able to be a writer. And he winds up working in the Bureau of Indian Affairs and- okay basically takes a totally different um, path, but he tries to be a writer throughout this entire period. So 1954 is Runner in the Sun, and then Wind from an Enemy Sky is published in 78, posthumously, the year after he passed away. Um, and then there's another really wonderful collection of his short stories um, called The Hawk is Hungry and other stories that someone has collected. Mm -hmm. Yes, they were well received. I mean, the surrounded was critically acclaimed at the time. Oh, go what ahead. What surrounded about? What what is the So this is this is it, right? So if you ask a lot of literary scholars who have looked at it, they would say it's autobiographical. Yeah. And and as is uh Wind from I'm, an Enemy I'm imagining Sky. the reservation is what I'm what immediately comes to mind when I hear the it surrounded is. is that, right? You're yes, surrounded. it is absolutely about a young man growing up on what is clearly the Flathead Reservation during the same period that he did. Mm -hmm. um, and what happens in, as a, in the wake of becoming surrounded yeah. by non-Native people. I mean, we recognize this as a classic example of settler colonialism's attempt to destroy and replace. Like he doesn't yeah. have that vocabulary, but that's what he's writing about. So Archilde, who is the protagonist in the story, is often taken by people to be Darcy, and mm -hmm. that this is essentially an autobiographical novel. My whole point is that, that I think that there's a lot of truth in that, but I also think that you have to read this against, which people don't, his diary, which narrates a very different story about who he was as a person. Mm -hmm. So The Surrounded, it's complicated. Everybody should still read it. I think it is considered even more of a classic now than it was at the time of its publication. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very dark story, but it uh, is not without hope. But mm -hmm. ultimately, I think it's a structural critique of settler colonialism. Um, it is not like this meditation on Indian identity and being trapped between two worlds. I think it's Anyway, but well, I, I uh, appreciate when, that. It reminds me of Maloud Farhoun's A Poor Man's Son from Algeria, which has the same sense that this person was actually very conscious of writing this autobiography, but also writing beyond the autobiography to make this, you know, point about a collective sense or or um, or even not just even collective, a more complicated appreciation for what these forces are and how they work on a person. It's not just sort of, here's the story of my life and the challenges that I struck. You're actually positioning this entire uh, era and this entire transformation that he lived through, through the lens of a person. I mean, I, I, you know, this book is a meditation on what Foucault would call modes of subjection. You know, so Darcy does not have that. He's not reading Foucault, right, obviously. Yeah. But let's Foucault or Heidegger those names up. We usually say, okay, let's get back to the person. <laughs> but the whole, yeah. But the idea is that what do you do when other people are redefining the spaces around you? Yeah. Right. And what implications does that have for how you conceive of yourself and how you be as a person? And that there are all these modes through which Native people are being surrounded. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not just geography. It's not just allotment. It's the 
presence of missionaries, it's the schools, it's the law, it's jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And our chill day is navigating this. Darcy definitely had to navigate this. I'm just saying they're not the same. I think that there's a point where his life, well, we can talk a lot about that. But my point is that at what point does Darcy's voice change because the people at the press said it needed to to tell the story they wanted non-Indians to read? And I don't know that we know that. Well, uh, Dan, I would just offer you this, uh, and this is a little off the side of Carolina Public Humanities uh, offer to you. If you ever wanted to come and do a great books reading group on the surrounded, uh, oh, yeah. which, that would be a weird open invitation because it sounds like a, a work we all should be exposed to and, and learn about. Yeah. So. Well, what I wanted to say is that I, th- for my money, Wind from an Enemy Sky is even better. Well, there you go. Either and, one. And, we'll take either one. What's Wind well, from an Enemy Sky about? What's that? What's that all? So he he returns to. So he was already starting to write this, and I and there's evidence of it in the diary. He was already trying to get this thing written when he was still finishing the Surrounded. So you okay. think about how frustrating that must have been for a person who just wanted to be a writer to have to wait forty years to this for this thing to get accepted for publication. But anyway. Um, Wind from an Enemy Sky takes us back essentially to the flathead. We move forward in time. It's very much, I think, it's, I guess, the autobiography of a community, for lack of a better word. I mean, it is definitely about events that are happening among, at Flathead, at the Flathead Reservation with a dam that's being built and what it's doing to the community and how do we deal with this. Um, And what happens when people who are trying to help you are hurting you? And that's something that he had a lot of time to think about because, you know, I mentioned he starts working for the government during the New Deal. And what the New Deal was trying to do in Native America was to turn the tide on allotment and assimilation to end it and to replace it with support for self-government, cultural pluralism, the reconstitution of reservation land. So they're trying to help. But the IRA, and he knows it because he was involved, does some good things. Oh, the Indian Reorganization Act, the New Deal in Indian country, it does some good things, but it has catastrophic implications for other communities at the same time. And, and by the time uh, when from an enemy sky is published, you have the red power era Mm -hmm. kind of come into its own. And he is writing work that we're familiar with that you've done on the fifties and sixties and the much with the American movement seventies. Yeah. Yep. And so he, that book, I'm not, I don't want to say anything because I'd love for everybody to read it and for us to talk about it, but it is dark, dark. Well, let's, we, we don't shy away from the dark, so we will invite you to come and do a, a great books reading group on that. Sounds really fascinating. We are yeah. good. We always, as always, we enjoy talking so much. I want to make sure we cover. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, his, his, he's involved in, he works for the government, you say. So he's, how long does this last? And, and then what other types of, uh, what other stages of his career should we know about in terms of other institutions he went to yep. and his other work? So, so John Collier is the person that Franklin Delano Roosevelt taps to be the commissioner of Indian affairs. Collier is the person who hires Darcy when he needs it the most. I mean, they're bouncing from house to house. They're falling behind on, you know, every payment known to humankind. Um, uh, they're, they're getting surprise pay cuts and everything else um, in the midst of the depression. Collier reaches out this olive branch and McNichol takes it and has his life redirected. So from the mid thirties, all the way to the, basically the mid fifties, um, Darcy McNichol works inside the Bureau of Indian Affairs, trying to promote tribal self-government. Um, mm-hmm. During that time, he, he becomes one of the founders of something called the National Congress of American Indians, which is the longest running pan-tribal okay. um, organization in the United States and um, political advocacy organization in the United States. He's a founder of that in 1944. He gets really disillusioned by this pendulum swing that happens after World War II, where the government essentially returns to assimilation. Yeah. And and its hostility toward tribal communities. It's a, they embrace a, a policy called termination and he wants no part of it and he leaves. So he becomes an activist outside the system at that point, but he uses all these connections that he's yeah. formed. And essentially what happens, I, I would, in a nutshell, what he winds up doing is devoting his life to community self-determination, 
working with tribes to empower communities to make decisions for themselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he articulates it in a way that's really consistent, frankly, with the language of nation building, of modernization, and ultimately of decolonization. So I think his life's work after he leaves the government is very much in the spirit of, um, we would call it decolonization now. And I think he was, I mean, he was thinking about it. He didn't make a point of waxing eloquent about decolonization, but that's what he was doing. Well, you know, that's a, a, we, as I talked to you and, uh, and uh, Dirk Moses, another colleague earlier this year, oh uh, yeah, because I teach decolonization, I just want to get a sense, how can we think about, uh, you know, indigenous people and decolonization, you know, and the creation of statehood or, uh, so he's, he's in that world, but he's not explicitly speaking that language. Is that, would that be accurate? Well, he, he is, and he isn't. And I guess that's the point. And that's, what's fascinating about him and the generation that I write about, which is the mostly the generation of the 40s and 50s and early, yeah. early to late 60s. Like Clyde but Warrior. Yeah, that exactly. Generation. Yeah. They're trying to figure out what this means, but haven't gotten it figured out yet. And that is that space, that middle space, that ambiguous liminal intellectual space that I think is fascinating. But no, I mean, he's looking at well, he, he's involved in something called the uh, Inter-American Indian Institute, which is a very modernization theory oriented, state-centered organization that is drawing together North and South American nation states that have large indigenous populations to help them, right? So, yeah. you know, this is, the, this is the 1950s at this point. Yeah. And... You know, McNichol's a part of that. He learns that language of development and modernization, but he doesn't uncritically embrace it. Mm -hmm. And I think he, like a lot of other people, are trying to find a way to make sense of these ideas on their own terms. And ultimately, I think he is a part of a bridge between sort of modernization and development theory and what we would call kind of national liberation and anti-colonialism. He's in between those two things. Wow. And he's a bridge between it. And, and but he's so- not, to, to be clear, uh, Dan, he's not working for the government anymore. After, uh, so he's doing, what does he do? How, he's, he stops working for the government in the 50s. So who, what, how is he getting access? Is he, you know, does he open, you would say he starts his own organization, National Congress of American Indians. But I mean, well, unless, brass, where is he working? How is he yep. getting, what institutions is he related to yeah. and how, what's going on in his life? He basically, there? so, I mean, at the NCAI is not his organization. Yeah. It's a pan-tribal organization sure, yeah. that advocates for native rights, uh, but he is involved in it. He basically, as he's getting disillusioned while he's still working in, in the government, he he, st- he he does start an organization. He becomes the executive director of an organization called American Indian Development. And this comes back to your earlier question. It's based in Colorado, and it does community self-determination work. So they focused on health. Then they, they focused on young people, youth, um, and something called the Workshop in American Indian Affairs. Um, but AID... American Indian Development has the same acronym as the Agency for International Development, yeah. which is a part of Harry Truman's Point Four sure. program. Yeah. And, and McNichol actually articulates in the early 50s something that he calls an American Indian Point Four program. And this is training and technical assistance to yeah. so-called third world underdeveloped nations, mm-hmm. right, to modernize. Well, yeah. he is he is absolutely thinking in those terms, but in Native America yeah. and on his own terms. Yeah. Um, so that's, so that's what that's, he's doing. He's the executive director of the agency uh, for American Indian Development. And then he winds up actually getting this honorary Ph.D. and he teaches um, at uh, Regina mm-hmm. uh, in Canada for a time and and then retires. Yeah. So it's interesting when he was working with the uh, American Indian Development, that organization, this is a, his work within the government probably was very helpful. I would imagine that he could oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, understand. And that's just a, you know, that's a remarkable ability to speak the language of the people who are doing the charitable work or doing that. And at the same time, to also speak the language of the people who are in need to say, this is actually how we translate that into something that will make our 
our communities productive in the way we want them to be productive and we want them to be uh, satisfying and uh, fulfilling for the people that live there. It's really uh, fa fascinating how he was able to work on both sides of those of that world. Yeah. You know, I have to tell you, I, I can't believe I forgot to mention this. The other thing that happens is in Chicago at the Newberry Library, which is a uh, world-class public. Where you worked with, what, what was your title there at the Newberry Library? Oh, I was the assistant director of the Darcy McNichol Center for American Indian and Indigenous <laughs> Studies. So he is the first director of that center and it is okay. then named after him. So he's, he's you know, he, he's, you know, there's a certain degree, I think, to which he is in a, a bit of a gig economy, you know, and, yeah. and it's a bit of a hustle because, you know, he doesn't have just like this one job and his career that for the rest of it, he's constantly kind of, I think, piecing together different opportunities. I mean, there's a certain degree of linearity there, but but not well, as I mean, much as, you know, someone just becomes a professor for 40 years. Well, it, and, and which makes it all the more remarkable. And it also gives us a sense that he is noticed for what he is doing to be recognized yeah. to, to not have ever gotten the degree, but to still get these, you know, appointments in academic institutions and to run this, you know, at University of Chicago, this is incredible. These are incredibly prestigious institutions. So he's noticed for his work and that, uh, and, and by, you know, colleges that are not, Native American institutions, right? They're not indigenous institutions. So how well known is he outside of the American Indian movement outside of this? I'm guessing not well known. And I, I had on one of my slides, I think the degree, he's not known well by people who think they know him. So, as you know, yeah. that I tried to play on those words a little bit. Um, you know, I think within the, the world of literature, you know, and, and scholarship on American Indian literature, he is very well known. Um, I think for folks who are really thinking about 20th century Native America and especially politics and activism, people at least would recognize the name. You know, his name is, is on the American Indian uh, and Indigenous Studies Center. So anybody affiliated with that would at least have this kind of name recognition. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think once you stick a toe outside of those circles, McNichol doesn't register. So I don't think he registers as a great modernist writer. You know, I don't think that he registers, I'm, I'm saying outside of the folks that are writing about yeah. him. And that's a shame. It, and it's also very typical of the marginalization of indigenous people. And here mm -hmm. he is living this whole life in defiance of these binaries that peripheralize and marginalize Indian people. And yet that's exactly where he resides, right? So he yeah. lived in defiance of all these stereotypes yeah. and yet is remembered in a way or not remembered in a way that reinforces those very things. Well, that's so. why we have, that's why we invited you and, and him today to talk about this. I, I want, we, we have to talk about this incredible project uh, that you worked on and we followed this last summer and you were working on this. Um, when we talk about his legacy and his impact, tell us about what you did with undergraduates here uh, for this wonderful project, the Darcy McNichol. Yeah. So what you're looking at there on the left is actually a page from his diary. That's just a page from 1962. But um, I've been teaching classes devoted to the diary, um, and they become a that diary becomes a lens to understand not just a, the biography of a person, but kind of the biography of a of a people, right? A collective experience. Um, so what you're seeing in the other two pictures in the front there um, is uh, Samara. And she was one of the members of an undergraduate research consultant team that I was funded um, for through the Office of Undergraduate Research. And then uh, Mackenzie uh, Kalura Rep is on the left in the lower picture. Mm -hmm. And Gabrielle Walton is on the lower right. And basically what we did is we transcribed a huge portion of the diary with an eye toward what it means for this thing to be a lens on someone's experiential world. And I'm drawing from the scholarship of James Clifford and his work on ethnobiography. He talks about okay. ethnobiography as, as thinking about a life as an experiential world. So how does a diary allow us to access experience in a way, for instance, that his novels do not, right? Yeah. Well, one of the things that he writes about all the time, and one of the reasons why his diary has essentially been dismissed, is gardening. 
And so we, the more we dove into this, the more we started asking ourselves, what, what is going on with the gardening, right? And what mm -hmm. we came to realize is that this is about more than a garden. Just like when he writes about the trips that he takes, he's writing about a hell of a lot more than a trip. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we reached out to the Carolina Community Garden and we asked if we could partner with them to plant a garden based on the things, the plants that he wrote about planting. Yeah. And so we essentially recreated Darcy McNichols' garden at the Carolina Community Garden and we created an exhibit, which you can see the posters for kind of in the background. And we created a website called the Experiential World of Darcy McNichol. Uh, and then we took another portion of the diary and we created a Google Earth story map, which allows you to follow him through his entries as he travels into the Southwest um, in 1942. And we reflect on, we try to recreate a sense of his experiential world through images, through text um, and whatnot. And yeah, and just try to get you to think about this diary as a means of thinking three-dimensionally about a person, not just the life that they lived, but how it is that they engaged in placemaking. Yeah. And how that those acts of placemaking are actually acts of refusing settler colonialism, refusing the idea that you are going to be destroyed and replaced, to refuse the logic of elimination. And so the garden then, we, you know, what does Darcy do? He plants, he grows, mm -hmm. right? He brings life into the world. He creates something that is beautiful in the midst of all of this. And the garden, and that garden writing, I think it was cathartic for him too. I think he's a person that worked himself to the point of exhaustion all the time. Uh, but yeah, the garden stands as a, as a window into multiple areas of his experience. You know, it just makes me think about, you know, the essence of settler colonialism is taking land from people, right? This is the essence of it, taking land and also the, and then all of what goes along with that, which we talk about the erasure of identity, the, uh, the you know, destruction of culture. Uh, but when you get back to the land itself and that that act of of controlling land and planting and growing and making land productive as a sense of place, does that enter into uh, his thinking about uh, about gardening? I mean, I, I, it's probably supposition that we we's not going to have maybe an explicit statement to that effect. But the sort of reclamation that you see when you when you work the land with your hands, I think it's ref I think it's refusal and reclamation. Okay. I think a garden is a reinscription of a sense of self in the world. Mm -hmm. it, is a, it is a reclaiming of place and of ownership and mm -hmm. of belonging. Yes. You know, and he, and I think his, his writing on this trip, I, I, I would love for you to share the links to folks so that they can go yes. visit the website. It is so worth it. And it was a ton of work that my students did. Well, I, um, this is where I miss my, my colleague, Paul Bonici, so much because he was the one who would always be able to put up our links at the same time. I'll try my best. If I type in experience, if I tell me what to put in my Google search here. The experiential world of Darcy McNichol. And it should come up as a UNC website. And from there, you can see a bunch of different pages um, and Two of them will take you, one will take you to the garden, the other one will take you to the uh, story map. But well, here um, we go. I've just found it there for you. So, uh, so yep. we'll be able, our, our, and we will uh, certainly share any, uh, when we put this up on YouTube, we can share any links you'd like to add. Uh, mm -hmm. Dan, we can share those. Dan, we are coming very much to the end of our hour. I just wanted, we have a, we have a, a small group of people with us today, but if uh, to, Number one, Tecumseh, exclamation point, or Brian or Charlie or Judy would like to ask a question. We're more than uh, happy to take a question. And, and we'll let that, but Lenny, as we close here, Dan, is there something that, um, are we, what is up for you in the future with Darcy McNichol? What are you going to be doing with more Well, workers? so the students and I, our, our undergraduate research consultant team project has technically ended, but I reached out to them with the opportunity to co-author and a piece with me. And we did not get that done, um, unfortunately, by the end of the spring. But I plan to return to that when the time is right. Um, and they seem to all be invested in it. 
Um, I will continue to elaborate on these, the website, and I hope to ultimately publish a, a biography based on the diary primarily. Uh, but that's going to take a bit of a backseat right now. I'm going on leave in the fall, and I'm going to be focusing on the, the biography of, of Clyde Warrior. I've been kind of doing these things at the same time, which is not a great strategy. You have, but. You have two open invitations from us. One is to come back and talk about Clyde Warrior um, in this format. And the other is um, we'd be very interested in learning more about Darcy McNichol as an author. So if you want to bring, uh, you know, bring a book and, and do a great books reading group with us, we'd love to learn more. Um, what an absolutely fascinating figure. Um, I'm afraid I, I, I didn't get into his personal life as much, um, but we can maybe cover that at another time. I know he was married three times uh, and had two children. Am I right? About uh, yes, that? that's right. Yes. yes, two children. Yes. So. Um, I, you know, unfortunately, I, I hate to, uh, marriage is obviously an incredibly important part of people's lives. But we've come to the end of our hour. So <laughs> um, at any rate, um, Dan, I do want to thank you so much for joining us. Um, please, folks, uh, check out uh, Dr. Cobb's work, fantastic work um, on this incredibly important topic. You know, this uh, um, indigenous culture and life is with us today. Uh, it is not, we, we tend to think of this as something in the past. We are talking about our fellow human beings who are still living with a lot of the legacies um, that we learned about today with Darcy McNichol and certainly some, you know, unfortunately we hear more bad news than good news and we should do all we can to make sure we hear more good news. So thank you for your work. I want to, we'll, we'll see you soon. Keep playing guitar, Dan. We're going to do a gig together at some point, I hope. I sure hope so. Yeah. Right. Well, thank well, you, Max. We miss you in 3D, and I want to thank you for joining us, folks. You can catch us for the dozens of people who signed up who will, in fact, watch this on YouTube, we hope. Uh, this will be posted in about a week or so. So we do appreciate you joining us, those who could today, um, and we'll see everyone soon. The, we have one more program, folks, just so you know, for Carolina Public Humanities. There is still room for Conceptions of Time tomorrow, a webinar, and there is an option for live attendance. So go to humanities.unc.edu if you'd like to either join us virtually or come and see something live. Unbelievable, right, Dan? It's slowly it happening. Is. So. Unprecedented. Uh, well, everyone masked and socially distanced, of course, but absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you one more time, uh, Daniel Cobb, for joining us, and we'll see everyone soon enough. Thank you. All right. Take, Take care. care.